Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Alliance for Health Policies webinar on potential midterm election implications for healthcare. I am Sarah Dash, President and CEO of the Alliance for Health Policy, and I will be facilitating today's discussion. For those of you who are not familiar with the Alliance, we are a nonpartisan organization dedicated to advancing knowledge and understanding on health policy issues. Our mission is to educate the health policy community on the pressing issues, and we're delighted to do that today. We're excited to examine the role of healthcare in the upcoming elections, as well as the potential health policy implications for Congress, the administration, and state governments. And I'll be introducing our speakers momentarily. The Alliance for Health Policy gratefully acknowledges the National Institute for Healthcare Management Foundation for supporting today's webinar, which is part of the Beyond the Beltway Health Webinars for Journalists series. If you're interested in joining the Twitter conversation today, please use the hashtag AllHealthLive and follow us at AllHealthPolicy. Before we get started, I'd like to briefly orient you to the GoToWebinar platform and review some technical notes. First, we recommend increasing the volume on your speakers to uh, get the best sound quality. Next, we've taken a screenshot of the attendee interface. You should see something that looks like this on your computer desktop in the upper right corner you can click the orange arrow to minimize and maximize this menu. You will be muted throughout the presentation, but you can ask questions by using the question panel to chat with us about any technical issues you may be experiencing, as well as to send in questions uh, that you have for the panelists. And we will collect your questions and address them throughout the broadcast. Finally, all webinar materials are available to download in the handout section of your attendee interface. And you'll find the materials that accompany this webinar on our website, allhealthpolicy.org, along with the recording of today's webinar. I'd like to introduce our esteemed panel of experts who are going to shed light on this important topic. Joining us today, we have Joanne Kennan. Joanne Kennan is Politico Pro's Executive Healthcare Editor. Since arriving in Washington in 1994, she has focused on health policy and health politics but her career, we are told, has had her cover everything from Haitian voodoo festivals to U.S. presidential campaigns. And uh, she jokes that sometimes it's hard to tell the difference. We will also have Jean Lambrou. Jean is a senior fellow at the Century Foundation. Her writing, research, and teaching focus on policies to improve healthcare access, affordability, and quality. Previously, Jean worked in the Obama administration, first as the director of the Office of Health Reform at HHS, and then as deputy assistant to the President for Health Policy. We have our third panelist here, who is Rodney Whitlock. Rodney is the Vice President of Health Policy at ML Strategies. He's a veteran health policy professional with more than 20 years of experience working within the U.S. Congress, where he served as health policy advisor and acting health policy director for Finance Committee Chairman Chuck Grassley of Iowa, as well as earlier on the staff of former U.S. Representative Charlie Norwood of Georgia. We are so grateful to have them here with us today to give their thoughts and best guesses on what is a very interesting election cycle. Next, I'll turn to our agenda for today. For those who have joined us for our, our previous webinars this year, we have formatted this one a little bit differently to allow for more of a free-flowing conversation. We're going to dive right into a moderated discussion, and you can see that we've created a five-part framework that will bring us through some of the major components of this issue. We'll spend about 14 minutes on each section. Um, and if you have questions, I will weave those in uh, to each section. Uh, and then finally, we will have time during the final thought section to answer any remaining audience questions, so please feel free to submit that at any time. So with that, let's go ahead and get started with today's discussion. First, I want to focus on just an overview of the 2018 midterm elections and what are some of the major trends. So let me turn to our panelists first and ask, how is this year different? Is it different? Is this a healthcare election? And, and what are the trends that you're watching? Joanne, you want to kick us off? 2018 is definitely a healthcare election. Now, as everybody on this panel knows, we know, and, and everybody in the audience knows, we, we have what I sometimes call the 24-second news cycle. Um, we, we sort of lurch as a country from crisis to crisis and scandal to scandal, and I do not know what will be foremost on people's minds when they actually go to vote in two weeks, two weeks, three weeks. Um, the, but we do know that there's a consistent, what, what voters are coming back to is health care. And, they, and that has shown up in all the polling for months. So whatever is the other scandal of the day or concern of the day or outrage of the day or hysteria of the day, healthcare is sort of this 
rock on domestic policy. It's what people are coming back to. And it's not just thing they care about. We are seeing that it's a motivating factor. It's a reason that's going to get people to the polls. Now, a few months ago, if you asked me what was the health care concern, I would have said costs because we were seeing that in you were seeing that both in the polling data and just as a human being, if you had a conversation with anybody, it would be about cost. Specifically, drug costs has come up in the polls, um, both Republicans and Democrats. But one night last June, um, the Texas, a Texas courtroom, uh, Attorney General uh, Jeff Sessions filed um, a federal position on what had been a somewhat obscure and not that much attention getting lawsuit. And when the uh, government of the United States actually joined 20 conservative states suing to overturn Obamacare yet again, it put pre-existing conditions squarely back in the spotlight. Sessions is not, the, the Justice Department is not trying to strike down the entire law, but they do want the court to strike down the most popular parts of it, which some might think is not a great strategy for Republicans a few months before an election. The pre-existing conditions, and other, some other related consumer protections, patient protections are now at risk in this Texas courtroom. It's a federal court, but it's in Texas. Um, it may take a year or two to play out in the court system, but in terms of, for the Democrats, it was a gift because they can say pre-existing conditions are at risk. And as we all know, pre-existing conditions, concern about pre-existing conditions, that is one of two issues, the other one being Medicaid, that stopped the Republicans from repealing Obamacare last year. So every campaign in the country, people are talking about pre-existing conditions. Thanks, Joanne. Jean, you want to jump in? Sure. So I'd like to build on that and talk about why. Why is pre-existing conditions such a top hot topic in this election? And I do think it goes back to last year, which is a reminder. Um, last year, we saw the Republicans pledge to repeal and replace the Affordable Care Act go from a political slogan to an imminent reality. So just looking at the House passed bill, the Congressional Budget Office estimated that it will cause 23 million people to lose coverage by 2026, result in destabilized markets in areas of the country where one-sixth of the population resides, and, quote, over time it will become more difficult for less healthy people, including people with pre-existing medical conditions, in those states to purchase insurance because their premiums would continue to increase rapidly. So everybody thought the debate ended last fall, but look at the TikTok. In October, the president issued an executive order looking for alternatives to the ACA's uh, insurance reforms. The same day, he stopped payments for cost-sharing reduction subsidies. In December, Congress uh, zeroed out the penalty for not having health insurance, the so-called individual responsibility provision. In February, as Joanne mentioned, we saw this lawsuit that took the zeroing out of the individual mandate penalty and said, aha, the law is now unconstitutional. It's no longer a tax. It's a requirement for people who have coverage, and there's no severability clause. The whole law should be struck down. Indeed, in June, the Department of Justice took a virtually unprecedented decision, or made an unprecedented decision to not defend the constitutionality of the Affordable Care Act and strike down some of the pre-existing condition protections. And if that is all not proof enough, even the responses to the Department of Justice action from Congress, the Republicans in Congress, has been inadequate. There's a non-binding congressional resolution that got introduced in the House would basically have no effect. And in the Senate, there's a bill called the Tillis Bill, which, in the words of the patient groups, would, in short, for people with pre-existing conditions, not provide access to coverage. So all that means that I think the resonance of pre-existing conditions in the field right now is they want checks and balances. They want a Congress that's going to come in and slow down, if not stop, prevent and protect the protections that people care about in current law. But I also think it's going to create a primacy on trying to find common ground because people who get elected want to do something and flip it around. There's a whole lot of Republicans that are up, especially in the Senate, in 2020 who also will want to find common ground to move things forward. I do think should pre-existing conditions continue to play out the way we are thinking it would, we'll see activity in the states. We already know there's four states with ballot initiatives on the Medicaid expansion that we'll, we'll know the outcome of in a couple of weeks. We also see states like California that with a Democratic governor may be 
um, incented to act. And last but not least, I think this kind of focus on pre-existing conditions will, as we'll talk about later, uh, tee up the 2020 presidential election. Thanks, Gene. Rodney. So Republicans are in an extremely difficult position here in talking about pre-existing conditions because they're not good at it. They have struggled mightily when confronted with the issue. Um, let's you know, roll the clock back to Jimmy Kimmel and him opening his show one night talking about his son, Billy, who will have a pre-existing condition for the rest of his life. And we all know that, and we react viscerally to that. Well, that's not right. We should be able to address that. The problem is Republicans have struggled meeting a simple standard, and that unfortunate standard for them has been if you're not protecting pre-existing conditions the way that the Affordable Care Act does it, you are failing. And so um, talking about Senator Tillis' bill, he says very openly on his website, we're not trying to replicate the ACA. Therefore, he will necessarily fail. The problem Republicans struggle with in this whole conversation is taking it beyond that simplistic notion that there's only one way to do it, which is, of course, not true. There are different ways to getting at this, at this question. How do you protect people you know, with pre-existing conditions? How do you make sure that they have access to services, those services are affordable? But everything I just said there all comes with shades of gray, and you have to define terms. And there, you know, Republicans have struggled engaging in conversations where they're trying to show this is how we're trying to get to that point. And this is why this is such an effective issue um, for Democrats running against Republicans because of the inability to message where you're going to be on these types of things. I think that when you, one of the ironies of polling over the last few years on the ACA is if you ask people, do you like the Affordable Care Act, Democrats, say, yeah, and Republicans say, you know, hell no, the intensity was much more on the Republican side. But there was always this funny thing where if you asked people, um, and the Kaiser Family Foundation did tracking polls for months, many months, and you can sort of see this quite consistently, if you ask people about provisions within the bill, people off, even people who say they, not the bill anymore, the law, people who said they didn't like the ACA actually liked a lot of what was in it. And, and on the on the uncarpeted side, even Democrats never really liked the mandate, very, the individual mandate very much. I mean, that was never, there was always sort of a gut, well, my, you know, a sympathy for, you know, should my government make me buy this? So the, the individual mandate was never particularly popular. The Republicans hated it. Democrats weren't that crazy about it. Um, but, you know, the Democrats, obviously, those who had the sophistication understood why you needed it and how the, the market worked and, and why you needed this incentive to keep people in. Pre-X is the opposite. Republicans really liked the pre-existing conditions, like just that basic idea without all the, you know, the legal conditioning around it or circumstances. And I think it's basically just a basic sense of fairness, you know, that Americans feel you know, if you're a kid born with something, a heart defect like Jimmy Kimmel's kid, or you get a disease and you've played by the rules and you've paid for your insurance, you should have protection. That's why you have insurance. And, and I think there's this, and that's what, you know, this has been a real sore point, as, as Rodney said, for the Republicans, because there is sort of this basic gut sense of, you know, there, but for the grace of God, it could be me or my kid, or this just doesn't feel right, that if you're sick, you're no longer protected. And that's why it has so much, I mean, it, it, it's in, there's so many ads across the country. There's so many politicians talking about their own pre-existing pre conditions, breast cancer for some of the women candidates, their children, heart disease, um, and Republicans trying to come back with, yeah, it's in my family too, and I understand, but saying I understand when you don't have a policy that supports it is, is um, not a good place to be in. I mean, they'll, if, if some of those Republicans win, and, they, and they, some of them will, it, it won't necessarily be because they have a great pre-existing condition answer. Let me spend just another minute on this and kind of try to tie a couple of things together. You know, Rodney, you mentioned that there are different ways to get at pre-existing conditions, and, and Jean, you mentioned that uh, perhaps there might be some um, drive to, to find some common ground, particularly on this um, very potent issue. Um, under the ACA, pre-existing conditions was part of kind of a three-legged stool that involved, included the individual mandate and the subsidies. Um, what are some of the different policy options and do they stack up in terms of, you know, numbers of people covered and, and protected? And could we, could we get into that for another minute or two? Sure, I'll, I'll jump in and then uh, certainly my colleagues can uh, correct me if they think I, I need to be corrected here. But effectively, pre-existing condition 
and the way you structure protections for that it is going to be a decision which basically says, for people who do not have pre-existing conditions, how much and how will I ask them to cross-subsidize the cost of people who have them? Because an insurer will look at them and go, I think the people with pre-existing conditions are going to be more expensive. I want to charge them more. So now to stop that, I've got to put a, a, a structure in place that in some way either subsidize that or limit the ability to vary. And so you start there. The ACA's structures basically say you cannot deny anyone who has pre-existing conditions, and then we limit the amount of variation between um, the healthiest to the sickest um, by, I believe it's three to one gene, correct me if I'm wrong. And so, and if you smoke, there's a little something extra for you there, but that's about it. And that's structurally how it's done. The, if you are not in the ACA, if you're in say, you know, private insurance that's governed under HIPAA, arguably it's a little more restrictive in that, that your community rated. So effectively everyone pays the same once you are, in, again, in an, you know, an insured situation. People have talked about the idea of high-risk pools or the invisible high-risk pools where you pull people out, look at them separately, and you know, do it that way. But we're talking about policy areas where we are looking at different ways to do it. In politics, it's either you are for it or you're against it. And that is how much so much it's being cast right now. I may argue it's less about being for and against than what you're for. Because back up nearly a decade ago, you know, the burden of proof for incoming president and the Democratic Congress was how are you going to do it? And is it enough? And is it too much? And what's regulation? And I could argue that the challenge of making the law work and kind of getting it up and going was because people were comparing it to an ideal, right? Like, I still find my premiums expensive. I still get surprise bills. So it's not perfect with the old comparator. Fast forward, Republicans are in charge. They're in charge of the White House. They're in charge of Congress. And they need to say what they're for. I think we learned last year that all stakeholders, most patient groups, um, even Republican governors weren't really for the solution that they came up with. So I think that's the new you know, pressure point. It's not for or against, it's what you're for compared to what people have now. So sure, the Affordable Care Act is far from perfect, but it is what people have. And if you're going to take away what they have, you have to prove that what you're providing is that works. And that has been, I think, the challenge. I think also people are very confused. Healthcare, as the president has famously said, is in fact complicated. It keeps us all employed. Um, but the people are blaming Obamacare for everything, right? No matter, most people don't, that's not how most people get their insurance. Most people get it through their job or, or a family member's job or if you're older on Medicare. But anything that went wrong in your health care, it became blaming on Obamacare. And, and you still see it, you know, several years out. You, if you watch the Obamacare haters on, on Twitter, it's, you know, my drug went up, you know, and it's got to be Obamacare's fault. And it, they have nothing to do with one another in many, many cases. But because of this ongoing confusion about what it is and what it isn't and what is it responsible and what it not and what it's not responsible for, it has let people on both sides of the aisle um, you know, keep, keep irritating some of that. Um, and... It's, it's, and yet it, it's, it's stabler than anyone thought it would be at this point. And just to add to that, and the people who have pre-existing conditions know what they got, right? So the community of people who have been discriminated against in the insurance industry are aware of it. People who have family members who have that experience are aware of it. So I'll again go back to the fact that, you know, even again, conditional on flaws, you know, 20 million people gain coverage, millions, tens of millions more gain these protections. And I think that is a constituency that wasn't there five, you know, even five years. I mean, when you went, if you looked at the town halls last year, it, that's what it was about. I mean, the, 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 what slowed down didn't eventually prevent. It, it, eventually, the House did pass its repeal bill, but it took them it took a lot more political capital, a lot more months than they ever thought. And those town halls last year were about pre-existing conditions. Like 99% of what people were up there talking about was pre-existing conditions. And people were frightened and angry that they were not going to get them. In the Senate, some other dynamics came in. A lot of it was the governors and Medicaid and the fact that the bill had gone, the repeal bill did more than repeal 
the ACA part of Medicaid, it did a lot more. That's, that's not on the table right now, but it will be again someday. Um, but that pre-existing conditions really is what set fire to what we quote, quote, you know, you can't see me here, but I'm making air quotes. Resistance really sort of grew up around the fight over ACA. So, um, so this has been a great discussion around pre-existing conditions. And um, before we kind of move off of the, the key topics that we're looking at um, in terms of the election three weeks from now, um, I just want to turn um, to Medicaid. We, um, as Jane mentioned, there, there are some uh, several states that have Medicaid ballot initiatives. Uh, what are you watching in terms of those Medicaid ballot initiatives? Are they the same across those states? And, and what do you foresee, um, if anything, as far as what um, an incoming uh, Congress might do around Medicaid? So there are three states who do not, three conservative states, uh, Idaho, Montana, excuse me, Idaho, Utah, and Nebraska, right, right. Right, who, that have not expanded the uh, Medicaid under the ACA and have ballot initiatives. And right now, there's not great polling on this, Right now, the, most people think they will pass. Now, it passed uh, last year in Maine, and the governor still, he's going to go out. He's the governor of the page. He's going to go out fighting. Um, Maine, Maine approved Medicaid in the first of these kinds of um, ballot issues by almost 60%, and the governor kept fighting. Uh, and that's now in the courts. And, and part of the governor's race going forward. It's not on the ballot in Maine. They already won. I would expect, I think it's quite likely that it passes in all these three states how the next those state legislators and governors respond, we will see. I'm not sure they'll fight it as, you know, what's the word for how, I don't know what word you would use for how, I mean, for, for, for the page, Governor Page in Maine, it's like his reason for living seems to be fighting Medicaid expansion. Um, it may not be that, um, I mean, Idaho is a really, really interesting state because here's this really conservative, rock solid red state and they've implemented the ACA. They run their own exchange, and they run it reasonably well, but they haven't. At the same time, they're trying to tear it down. They had a proposal to, to basically get rid of it, which went too far even for the HHS under, under President Trump. So Idaho is going to be sort of fun to watch. We just had a report out there last week, in fact. Um, so I, I think that they'll probably pass. I mean, we could be proven wrong because my gut feeling is they'll pass. I've said things that are wrong before. Montana is a little different because they have expansion, and the ballot initiative there has to do with tobacco taxes in order to pay for ongoing uh, Medicaid bills. And I, I'm not sure if there's any polling on that. Do you know that one? I, I do not. Um, I think it'll pass, but I, I'm not as familiar with it. So I, I think one of the things you are seeing, particularly um, in some of the more red states that did not expand, is perhaps a growing recognition that there's all this money they could have been taking to this point, and eventually they may have to consider taking it. And rural right. hospitals sure want it. And the community health centers. I mean, no, there's an argument to be made that you are turning down this money. Now, state legislatures uh, where they have ballot initiatives have two choices, do it themselves and own the decision and the responsibility for it, or put it on the ballot and let the community writ large make the decision for them. Um, if you see it pass in three states you know, in November 6th, I think you might see a, uh, a bit of a wave there start to develop. And I would just add, beyond those three states, this is a hot topic in the state of Georgia with the governor's race. It's come up in Kansas a fair amount, so it is not just a ballot initiative state, but it does cut more on traditional lines in those states. So let me this has come close, and, and, and it was, that was a Republican versus a totally Republican state. It was a moderate Republican versus more conservative Republican fight. The moderates did favor expansion and lost. So we'll see what happens next year. In terms of federal policy and the, the question of states you know, leaving a lot of money on the table, the, the original Medicaid expansion, I believe, was due to uh, the 100% the, the FMAP has been phasing out over, um, over the last um, number of years. So what do you foresee, if anything, about like a push to, at the federal level to get some of those latecomers to the game, um, you know, additional federal resources, or is that is that completely off the table? Sure. I mean, there has been a bill um, introduced by Senators Kane and Warner for obvious reasons, because Virginia was a late expansion state, that would, instead of having that 100% match attached to years like 2014, 2015, 2016, it would attach to the first year of expansion. Um, that bill could potentially have more bipartisan support because at this moment in time, 
most of the states out there would be red states who would benefit from it. Um, and I do think there's been a renewed thought about what support states could be getting from Congress that might be more amenable to it. So I think there could be some action there. So let's turn now to um, our, our second kind of main topic, which is uh, the, the post-election, immediate post-election or lame duck scenarios and um, understanding that there may be uh, a number of different scenarios that might play out. Um, we have a question um, from the audience here, which is how concerned um, how, how concerned should we or how concern, how much concern should there be um, about uh, Republicans trying to push through an ACA repeal, including Medicaid cuts or caps, during a lame duck session, uh, particularly if they lose the majority? So we'll, we'll start off the next question with, with uh, next section with an audience question and, and go from there. I, I think that is a bit of a stretch to imagine. Um, the House of Representatives and who is left and who is – the House has already passed the bill, the American Health Care Act. Or would they be convinced to come back in and try again? Um, the Senate, uh, remember that uh, you have um, uh, was 52-48. It is now 51-49, me meaning that you'd have to find a way to convince two senators to change their vote. I continue to find that to be rather outlandish. And some Republicans, um, and I think you even see this in certain Republican races out there, at some point, Republicans missed an opportunity to say mission accomplished. Um, they didn't have an aircraft carrier and a banner to do so. But once they repealed the individual mandate and implemented AHPs and SPLDIs, short-term limited duration insurance plans and association health plans, and began to make the changes they did administratively, at a certain level, they could have done more to declare victory to take them out of the situation where you'd be asking that question. Um, also, they don't have a reconciliation bill during lame duck. They need 60, don't they? They would. Uh, no, you're right, because they use on taxes. Uh, right. But they could use, we're in the new budget year, you could do. They could do, a, they could could do, do reconciliation with, in lame duck. It would be, we're talking really, right. really. I will remind you that the uh, this current Congress that we're still in did reconciliation instructions during a lame duck while President Obama was still in office. So it is not. Uh, exactly. But I mean, the two that would have to switch would be Susan Collins and Lisa Murkowski, and I don't think any of us see either of them switching. I mean, sure. Although going back and looking at lame ducks, I think it's an interesting period of time. Um, I was around during what will be the most comparable one, which is 2010, right after there was Democratic control of the White House, Democratic control of Congress, and then there was a midterm election. And what happened in the, in the lame duck? Interestingly, Pew Charitable Trust did an analysis of lame ducks and found that. Looking at 2010, 99 laws were passed, and that represented nearly a third of the substantive output of the entire Congress. I mean, things happen and can happen, especially if there's a change and there's an outgoing Congress. Why would that be? There'll certainly be potentially interest in some of the tax bills that we saw floating around the House on health savings accounts, uh, employer mandate relief, maybe more extensions, I mean, that all adds up to $100 billion, but that could be on the table. Flip it around, um, you know, there may be Democrats who want to who go along with some of that to get out of the way because, you know, next year is going to be a year where they're going to be willing to put forward a positive agenda should they gain one of the chambers, and they may be interested in, again, cutting deals there. We hear that there might be a big wall fight, which yeah. means there's opportunity for, again, negotiations, and there could be policy put into that negotiation. Um, and last but not least, this lame duck is going to be full of announcements. So this Texas case that we talked about, the judge is supposed to rule as soon as possible. The plaintiffs asked for an injunction for January 1. Decision in that one, there's a long there's a short-term plan lawsuit decision sought by November 1. There's a couple new rules that will come out probably next couple months, which also could incent activity. The term of art that uh, I know that we used on the Hill to refer to lame ducks, and I think what you described there is called clearing the decks. And there are going to be opportunities to do things that you do under this current configuration that you know will be more difficult in the next. And so that will motivate a lot of what we see during that period. And for those of us who would like to be home for good by Thanksgiving, oh, no, we are likely to be working on eggnog or maybe all anxiety. 
Right, but also they did finish, I mean, unusually, they did finish the labor age, the health spending bill, and that's done. And so the wall fight, the, you know, the fight over Trump's border wall and other issues that are unresolved that I guess it's a December 7th deadline, um, they, they, they have, it's not that they can't hang health care. If you want it, you can find a way on many things. But the main vehicle for putting a lot of the health care stuff is this labor age spending bill, and that is – uh, quite unusually been addressed. So yes, and there are other taxes. No, and I will go back again to another of my fond uh, lame duck memories was in the 2012 lame duck as a reminder. Uh, we all stayed here and had a New Year's Eve deal um, on continuing the doing continuing resolution and a whole bunch of policy. And as a reminder, while well, that was, you know, I think labor age was part of that that, that care. Was, yes. But we also had the repeal of the Class Act and the creation of the Long-Term Care Commission and rescinding co-op funding in that particular round. So note that it doesn't always match up. Right. The um, the other issue that is going to probably come up in the lame duck is the, the, what's called the donut hole, which on the budget bill, the budget bill a few months ago, there was a change that pharma is very unhappy about, about making pharma pay more toward this coverage gap on Medicare that when people – it basically means pharma has to pay more to subsidize people's drugs. Um, and pharma is uh, trying to – they are not. They won't be able to get that rolled back entirely, but they are trying to get it um, made less. And they failed a few weeks ago when they tried um, on, on the labor age bill. Um, it, we do expect that to come back, and – they're not going to. They didn't. They're not going to give up on that. I mean, that'll be that's their top priority, and and for the lame duck, and I think that'll be one of the health issues that we do see. Um, I don't know how it'll play out. I, I think I wouldn't be surprised if they get some of what they're seeking. I, they may not get all of it. Right. Um, so, I think one of the things that will make this a particularly fascinating lame duck is what I consider to be the sort of the nexus of all of these decisions. And if the trends, and currently the trends do certainly go in the direction of the House flipping, um, I think that the Senate still seems like a coin flip either way. Um, and I would point out, I don't think I'm out on any particular radical ground here, because if you look at 94, 98, 02, 6, 10, and 14, five of the last six midterms have ended up with one chamber flipping. So I'm not crazy out there suggesting a chamber could flip. But if it does, think of the calculus it creates. And so for me, all of these flow through the office of one Chuck Schumer, because he has this opportunity to decide in a gatekeeper role what he wants to let go now versus what he wants to reserve on the table for 2019, because there will be certain legislation that with a Democratic House of Representatives has no chance of moving that he may want to clear out now. And then there may be things he would perfectly happy to wait to see there. And this goes for every policy issue, not just those in our little parochial health care space. But for example, you look at something like the health insurance tax big or the device, care. I'm sorry, our big <laughs> parochial health care space. But if you look at something like the health insurance tax, the device tax, you look at creates, you look at you know, the donut hole, I mean, the, the senator from New York does have a lot of control because of the legislative filibuster in determining when he wants to say no and when he wants to let himself get rolled and they actually do something that is a compromise. And, you know, I can't begin to speak to how he will decide that calculus, but I'm pretty certain it rolls through his office. All right. Well, um, Anything else on the lame duck that we've missed? Before? Something that we probably haven't thought of will pop up because it always it'll pop up. <laughs> somebody, somebody will say this is my last chance. Yeah. And, and we, you stock know. up on eggnog seems to be the uh, the message here. So let, moving on to the 2019 agenda and what might be on the docket, um, regardless of how the elections turn out, are there any must-pass bills? Um, and when it comes to healthcare for 2019. Uh, so Ronnie and I are talking about this, so we can we can order this in different ways. But typically, you look at the uh, so-called extenders as the area where you'll see must-pass activity. We now can rack up a good 10, 12 policies that are effective through the end of 2019 and then stop. 
which means that Congress will need to act to restore, renew, prevent a cut, or whatever that particular activity is. And that tends to be an engine, um, a vehicle, as they call it, for moving various and sundry policies. Um, the Medicaid disproportionate share hospital payment cut goes into effect in fiscal year 2020. We have the Community Health Center Fund that would, um, its, a, it's additional appropriation would end. Uh, smaller policies like um, this GYP, GYP C4 for physicians, which is about geographic adjustment, and I can go on. Irrespective of their size um, and their scope, they tend to be, again, engines and drivers with mostly pluses, usually not minuses, meaning they're costers, which means that the upcoming Congress is going to think hard about when these happen and how they happen, um, and are they offset. So from a legislative point of view, and having been in that role, Tara, you've done this as well, which is if I'm engaged in a conversation about these pieces, that is a very limited conversation. Now, paying for them, that's certainly going to be a challenging conversation. But I think what's going to be interesting about 19 will be the configuration in Congress. You know, do we have a, a Democratic House who needs to um, exert you know, the election outcome by you know, coming up with policies they want included in something like this? You know, where are you with the Senate? Um, and a place to think about that, again, is the 2007 after that election and after that flip, and we had a bill that we had to move through, the CHIP bill, the reauthorization of the Children's Health Insurance Program, where the Senate was able to work on, on a bipartisan basis, a very limited bill. The House, now in Democratic hands, basically said, oh, hold my beer, I want to do some work here, and went into all sorts of controversial spaces. And to my friends who worked on that, please accept my apology for that metaphor, but they went into all sorts of controversial spaces, which had no prayer in the Senate in 2007. You know, will that be something we watch for in 19? And it's not must pass, but I think you may see. There, there's some opportunities for some interesting um, developments that could occur with the House, assuming the House goes Democratic, could the House Democrats work with President Trump on any of the drug pricing legislation? And then, of course, there are all sorts of political calculations that are going into 2020, but a lot of the, I mean, when, when President Trump, then candidate Trump, started talking about drug prices, it surprised many of us. It really is something we associated that senators, Republican senators weren't talking about it by and large. I mean, some of them have on certain aspects, but the, the big message about drug prices was more of a Democratic issue. So that'll be sort of interesting to watch, and it'll that'll get tied up early on with larger politics about 2020 and Trump. Although I may argue, before the 2020 cycle begins in earnest, it started. It will, yes. it will be in earnest. I said in earnest. Uh, there's always that kind of Six, we run through August recess of kind of that first year, either first year for a president, president being in office or the midterms where there's an opportunity, right? Yeah. And I think most people would have to say, going back to your earlier point, when you ask people what they're concerned about is costs, healthcare costs and drug prices are high up there. And that may be easier in a way to deliver on than many, other, many of the other items, especially given the president's statements about drug prices, the Secretary's blueprint and all the sorts of activities. So I would argue that this must-pass legislation may be linked up with kind of these other more signal policies. And obviously there's tons of policy in the drug space. It never is easy, but we've seen themes around promoting generics, trying to do more transparency. What do we do about high-cost drugs? A little harder issue, but I wouldn't be surprised if there's not serious attention and maybe that strange kind of bedfellow, you know, handshake by the President with a potentially Democratic House and their Senate. Right, and this is, I mean, this is not a, a president that sticks to a topic. And actually, drug price is something he has come back to over and over again since the final stages of his campaign. And he does seem to consider it a domestic priority. So I don't think you would necessarily have the whole, you know, 40 item blueprint enacted, but could you do, could some things happen? Um, I mean, they're already happening, some are happening on a regulatory basis for the FDA. Um, can you see more? sort of mid-level legislation on drug prices, I think you could see some. It's, you're not, you're not going to get importation through without a lot of safety caveats that mean it wouldn't happen. Or um, 
the government negotiation of drug prices probably wouldn't come through. But could there be sort of other that may be sort of more technically difficult to explain in this setting? But could things happen that would address drug prices? Yes. Could the create spill is one of them. I think, though, here I'll be the skeptic. I do think that in as much as there are negotiations with the secretary, I could see activity here. I remain very skeptical that Democrats are going to be comfortable trying to work out anything that involves the president. And just working off the, the metaphor I think that, that you suggested, I believe last September where we ended up was Democrats worked out a short-term deal with the president um, where the president effectively rolled the speaker and the majority leader to their side of the conversation, yet a few months later we had uh, a shutdown occur largely over reaction you know, aghast to his shithole countries remark, which then drove uh, a lot of people away from the table with him. And so if he is integral to it, I'm, not, I'm far from convinced Democrats can participate. And I will just, being glass half full, argue that if indeed there is a, putting aside the president, if there's a whole bunch of young, new Democrats in the House of Representatives, they don't want to go home empty-handed. I mean, I think that you always have to remember that this is a new generation, this is a largely a different generation, a new generation running on health care. So I do think that the, um, they may put producing results over traditional partisanship. But let me add two more, because I still think that the opportunities next year may be bigger than I should. Um, the opioid epidemic continues to drive attention in this country in ways that are not traditionally partisan, and I do wonder if there couldn't be another version of a bill, one that might be bigger, I think, than the one that just happened, not in terms of the number of provisions, but in terms of the impact on um, larger coverage policy and spending. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised if there's a kind of more robust uh, bill around in and around opioid addiction. Um, and the sleeper would be, could you pull off a health insurance marketplace stabilization bill? You know, we know there's bipartisan policy out there. There was a bill last year that could have had 60 votes, as we all kind of know. Will that come back? I think that one, that one, I think it might be harder for this president to sign into law, but um, they could also bring some of that state by state through waivers. Right? They don't want to do it. If they want to get to that, it was basically a way of shoring up the markets, I think. We're talking about Marie Alexander, right? Um, and and there was, they got pretty close a couple of times to, in the Senate at least, to some kind of deal that would stabilize the markets in exchange. There were some other political compromises. Um, four or five states, I think it's what's today? Seven. seven states have waivers. They've been successful. They have brought down prices, um, premiums in in some of these states. So you could do, you could, and it's been blue and red states. Some of the states have surprised us that you know they're not how Obamacare sticks, but they have decided to try to stabilize the market for their own uh, citizens. Um, if, so if they can't do this legislatively, um, and, and maybe they could, because if it's a Democratic House, they'd go for it. Can, you know, can, can Alexander Murray reconfigure and get 60 votes in the Senate? Maybe. It's, it's, it's harder than it sounds on the surface. Yeah. Um, it's a maybe, but there are also other ways that these problems can be addressed through which I think really you, you pivot to a really interesting question, which is what is this administration going to do with their regulatory authority in 2019 and 20? Um, watching to see where they go with the, um, the use of the waiver authority. Um, they've got a, a person actually in charge at CMMI, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation. What if they suddenly discover we like this idea of authority and watch us use it? Um, that could be an utterly fascinating conversation for all of us in 19. Sure. I'm going to say, you know, these 1332 state innovation waivers, I mean, we saw a whole lot of activity or interest in it last year. There could be more activity there for sure. I mean, to date, it's been used by states like New Jersey to, you know, get reinsurance and use a restoration of the individual mandate penalty to pay for it, which is a kind of interesting twist, but we'll see what happens. Um, but again, like states like California, there's governors running on more aggressive agendas could they ever use 1332 and get it approved through this administration? Question mark, right? Um, but I think it's going to be interesting here. 
and then it has been a very active. I mean, they could not get repeal through the Senate. They have certainly done a lot on a regulatory basis for HHS and CMS um, to, to to advance that repeal agenda without actually repealing. The, the, the legislative piece, of course, will say didn't repeal the, the mandate penalty, but introducing association health plans, introducing these short to well enlarging and extending these short-term plans because they're now not so short. Um, a number, you know, reducing the outreach, a number of things, and, and we will really see their impact or their lack of impact next year because, first of all, the courts may stop some of them. We don't know. States are taking steps to countermand in some states, like California and Tennessee, ban the short-term plans. And, of course, the, the exchanges have actually, they haven't grown uh, over the last few years. They also haven't imploded. And even states like the state everybody was worried about, which was Tennessee, you know, the sort of poster child state for the death spiral and it was going to fall apart. I'm pretty sure their their premiums went down for 2019 and it's much more stable in their new entrance. There's more overall next year. Their uh, premiums have dropped. The, 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 the benchmark average is 2% drop. And that's not true of every plan. It's not true of every state. But after almost 40% the year before and 20 something the year before that, I mean, it's it's a big change. It is a stabler market, despite the CSRs going away. It's not a growing market, but it is not an imploding market. It's a muddling through market. And, you know, when you have the – that sort of – for the Democrats, muddling through is as good as they're going to get right now. It didn't implode. It didn't get repealed. Their hope is they can build on in the future. And the point estimate for Tennessee is the premiums are dropping by 26%. But, but what's interesting with where you just went, Joanna, is – that's totally inconsistent with the political narrative. Democrats are absolutely committed to saying, Republicans destroyed the Affordable Care Act, we have to go to Medicare for all. And Republicans are absolutely committed to saying, the, the Affordable Care Act is evil, it is wrong, we need to kill it, and none of the above is actually happening. What you just described it's is actually through. reality. It's muddling through, and then there's a lot of new threats to the market next year. We don't really know how people are going to respond to the mandate. I mean, and also, and that's one of the court the issues before the court. Is the mandate as important in 2019 as it was in 2014? People thought that the elimination of the CSRs was going to be a complete disaster, and they figured out, you know, what's called silver loaning, loading, which is a way of shifting the costs around and making everybody happy. Um, to, to give the technical explanation, right? Um, <laughs> so, I mean, there have been many times on both sides, as Randy just said, both sides have been surprised. Um, and, and do the Democrats end up with a narrative saying it's it's good but not great and we want to build on it or, you know, Republicans end up deciding they have to live with it and pull it to the right rather than, which is what some of the centrist Republicans are saying, they want to pull it to the right, they don't want to nuke it. Before we go there, though, I do want to go back to one other change that would happen should House or Senate change uh, control is oversight. Um, yeah. You know, when you talk about executive actions, I can say with lots of personal experience that uh, aggressive litigation and oversight makes a difference. As a reminder, both the House and the Senate, um, Democrats have resolutions that would enable their legislative councils to sue to defend the Affordable Care Act, including its pre-existing condition and protections. There would be more scrutiny of what goes on in the administration large writ, HHS in particular, especially given some of the concerns about how are the exchanges operating, how much funding is going on for outreach? What are you doing in your rulemaking? And if nothing else, going back to my original, what are people looking for in this is this election? It's a check and balance. And I think that check and balance might be something that will be palpable in addition to being able to use hearings, which is, again, something, Rodney, you know better than me, to set an agenda. Um, so I do think we shouldn't overlook that is a power that is gained with a majority that I think should there be a change, you will see a lot more health care. And, and all these these new forces that are surrounding the markets, we don't know how it'll turn out. It couldn't. 2019 could turn out to be a disastrous year if the if you know the if AHVs and the short-term plans they become extremely popular. But the reality is that the people in the exchanges are mostly subsidized, not 100%. And the problem still is that people who don't have subsidies are having a whole lot of trouble paying for health insurance. If you don't get a subsidy and you're in the individual market, it costs a lot of money, and that is something that's has to be addressed as a larger issue back to where we started about the cost of care, not just the cost of your premiums, but the cost of the cost of care. 
if these new plans, these short-term plans and so forth, really, if it's the, un, the currently uninsured who go for those because they can't afford a change plan, exchange plan, then you could have these parallel. It's not the ideal, wonderful, diverse market that the designers of the ACA wanted, but it, it lets you keep muddling. Let's go, before we turn to um, 2020 and, and even more uh, looking into the crystal ball, um, we did have an, another audience question. Um, again, kind of going back to the, the cost question, which was um, whether any of you have thoughts on whether there might be a congressional or regulatory agenda focusing around healthcare consolidation in the industry, and particularly with so many um, blockbuster mer mergers and acquisitions taking place. What do you foresee there? How will that affect consumers, if, if at all? We're seeing it in the state. I mean, we're, we're, basically most of the hospital mergers, most, not 100%, have gone through under both administrations in recent years. Um, I, the, the big insurance mergers was a, a year or two years ago, they, they were halted. But then we have these new um, different kind of healthcare animals, which is the drug company, the PBMs, not the pharmaceutical majors, but the, the, the retail drug and the uh, pharmacy benefit managers um, merging with insurers. Um, so CVS and Express Scripts, and there's a whole new, I always forget which one matched with which. It's, it's, it's Aetna and CVS, right? Cigna right. and, yeah. um, and ESR. Right. Um, so those are really new, and um, there are people skeptical. I mean, the, the defenders say it's economy of scale that will big bring down prices, and other people says no, economies of scale just raise. I mean, consolidation is just making prices go up. We're still struggling with the um, belief that better integration of care and, and uh, um, ACOs and other ways of, 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 a, of a more coordinated approach should, in theory, save money. But if it just becomes monopoly, then you're, you know you have two countervailing pressures. Um, I don't think they're going to stop the mergers at the federally, but uh, in California, there's a big there's a case that everybody's watching, which is again Sutter, which is a um, dominant chain in Northern California. The uh, prices in Northern California are premiums and healthcare costs are much much higher than. Southern California, the hospital in the industry, because I was there this week, last week, so I can tell you fresh, they say it's all because of labor costs and unions and wages and being higher in, in Northern California, but there's some economists who've looked at that and factored that in and say, no, nope, <laughs> it's consolidation. So there's a big sort of landmark lawsuit on that. And let me ask, you know, if, I don't know if Rodney or Jean want to want to weigh in, but, you know, is this issue, does this issue hinge on the outcome of the election, or is this more... Um, as you said, um, Joanne, it's in the states. It's with the state AGs. Um, it's with the the federal regulatory agency. The FTC hasn't been that aggressive in the past on hospital mergers. If you're somebody who's a legislative staffer and you want to and you want to follow an area, one of the things that you have to to think about beforehand, assuming you do the job well, <laughs> um, where am I going? What am I going to do? And I think one of the things that Congress struggles with and why I think you see a limited amount of interest in the subject from, for Congress compared to other areas where they've been is the problem with the answer to that question. What am I going to do, get in the Wayback Machine and pull out my Teddy Roosevelt and go break up trusts? I mean, exactly what is it I'm going to do once I start down that road? I think people on, on the Hill, when they talk about this subject, it, it's almost as if they're like, well, okay, but what am I going to do about it? So the question is, are there, if you can't go back to Teddy Roosevelt, I mean, is California really going to try to break up Sutter, or are they going to try to change behaviors and outlaw certain kinds of contracting practices and gag rules and other things that have um, created a lack of transparency and more market power for these hospitals? So I think we, we actually, a bunch of reporters were there last week and talked to the uh, Attorney General, but there and did not get it totally clear answer on this, but I came away with the impression that it was a behavior change rather than a, a, a Sure. I will say, though, this has, I think, contributed to some of the discussion about public plans and Medicare for more, Medicare for all, because there's a view that if, indeed, this is unstoppable and this is resulting in higher prices, and look, I think nobody has yet refuted the late great Uwe Reinhardt says the price is stupid. That's why our healthcare costs are so high in this country. Um, there is, and we've seen this in, go back to California, they have the surprise out of network emergency bill provision, or excuse me, law, that would cap what health plans pay to out of network providers for certain services at a multiple of Medicare. 
using Medicare rates and private insurance as a backstop. And I think some of what we're seeing now with concerns about consolidation as well as what's going on in rural areas where, look, we have, we have monopolies in rural areas too, and prices are really high in many places. So I think those two things are driving some of the discussion about, you know, looking more at what public plans do and how they can address. Well, let's take this opportunity to now move on to 2020 and perhaps, well, I'm not going to even say beyond, but let's just kind of, uh, let's kind of try to look ahead at 2020 and, and what are some of the bigger picture themes that might emerge uh, as we, as, as we said, we're kind of already in the, the presidential election cycle. Um, I don't know if it's officially now or, or the day after election day, but, um, you know, uh, how might the, the current uh, midterm elections or the 2019 agenda kind of lead forward into what, what kind of conversations may take place about healthcare in 2020? Exactly where Jean just went. No question about it. We're going to have a, it will start in 20 and it may bleed into 21, which is a debate over a very simple question, which is if you think costs are a problem, if you think it's the prices, we can do something about that. We can simply control them. We're the government. Watch us do it. You don't think we can? Watch us. And Medicare for all, Medicaid for all, single payer, uh, all payer rate setting, reference pricing, uh, they're all going the same direction, which is if you have a problem with how much things are, what the prices are in Northern California, here, watch me. I'll wave my hands together, snap my fingers twice and three times, and look at that. I just set all the prices. Now let's have that. And yet single payer fails in California probably because they couldn't figure out the, yeah. the economics. Because matter. you completed three or four different things at once, right? And this is what happens with this debate. This is a debate that often uh, gets jumbled in the term. Single payer could be administered 100% through private insurers paying rates that they negotiate with plans, right? That's sort of what Netherlands does. Exactly. Yeah. And vice versa, you could have an entirely privately run system that has some sort of combination of regulatorily set prices and negotiated prices, which is Medicare Advantage. So I think when we, ha we have to begin to parse out this debate and figure out what's going on, um, and I think this is going to be a question of what problem are you trying to solve, right? And I do think that We'll have this debate in a very uh, rigorous way, I think, in the next couple of years. But going back to where we sit today, we're talking about a midterms, we're talking about people concerned about losing. Um, keep going, those people with employer-based coverage are a little bit worried about their deductibles going up, their premiums being high. What can policymakers do about that and what are the, the solutions? So public plans have a spectrum from like the California policy where they're using Medicare rates to Medicare for all at the other extreme but compared to what, right? Because again, the Republicans have to come up with their plan, and last time I checked, the Graham Cassidy type of approach, which is take all the ACA funding for coverage, put into a block grant, send it to states, and devolve decision-making decision to states, is your compare and contrast. So I do think when we're talking about this, there's one side that's gonna be choosing interventions and problems, focus on Medicare, and what is good about it. And I think the other side is going to be talking about more fundamental, you know, what is the role of government? Well, what problem do you think that they are trying to solve? I mean, is it access or is it cost? I think you hear different people saying different things. Um, if you listen to Senator Bennett and Kane, who sponsored this Medicare X bill, it starts in rural America. It would go into areas where there's um, either a provider shortage or only one insurance company in the individual small group market. And in those circumstances, the public plan would offer where there's no other choices, and then over time it would face it. That's their problem. Keep going. Um, look at the Shaheen surprise bill legislation that just got introduced. It's using a Medicare rate cap on what plans would pay when you um, have some out-of-network provider for what is an in-network service. And it's a way to avoid, avoid balanced billing. So that's a consumer problem. So different problems for different bills. But are the, the core problems still priced in every spot? No, market failure is what the Kane Bennett bill is about. There's literally, I mean, what is the alternative to getting affordable insurance in rural Colorado? What's the issue with the affordability? Is it the price? 
prices and premiums, yes, in rural Colorado. So right. can, prices drive the premium. So it, it, I, I just, my own and point is keep always coming back to price. Okay. And the answer is for Republicans? Oh, listen, I've watched Republicans spend six years saying only three words to every problem, repeal and replace. If you think that they need, necessarily need to have actual solutions to sit comparatively, I don't think that's at all necessary. Which I think is what this debate is going to be about. Going into 2020, it's not, you know, maybe it is preserving the improving status quo, and I don't want to dismiss that because it's a long way sure between here and there, and it could be that we're hearing our extremes talking about these big ideas to, you know, get at the fundamentals of the system, but I think we have to have a contrast of ideas, and that's what I'm hoping for, and that's why I'm glad that you're doing this seminar <laughs> early and often because it's great. we need to have an informed and, and we will do it early and often, and, you know, and I just, as, as you all are speaking, I'm just wondering, are, you know, are we, again, going to kind of find ourselves in this conundrum in which the voters and the, the, the public is, is really concerned about costs, really concerned about prices, and then we start getting into that conversation, and you know, for some people, the answer is uh, rate setting, price control, um, you know, that kind of thing. And then for others, it's, you know, market-based, market-driven solutions. Um, and then we kind of get into a, a debate, but end up and it's really not really any further. Uh, and it's really easy to price use, and it's really easy to obfuscate. Right. And we, I mean, we, I think we all saw the president's op-ed the other day was, you know, that the Democrats want, you know, I called it Venezuela care, that, you know, that, <laughs> that you know, that the Democrats wanted to turn the United States into a Venezuelan health care system. And I don't think you could find one Democrat anywhere in the country who regards Venezuela as their model for health care. But it's going to be um, something that they can, I mean, that people have been pounding government control. I mean, that's why it took 100 years to pass the ACA. Um, Americans are receptive to the, the the message that you don't want government to to control your health care, even though it's already controlling. Unless you have a Medicare, health. unless it's right. a Medicare card, right? But I mean, that's been a very effective political tool for going back to the 30s, and we are going to hear a lot about it in the next few years. And there are probably some things you could choose to address in a bipartisan basis, but we're not in a very bipartisan mood in the country, except for opioids. And Gene, I'm not necessarily telling you I'm going to enjoy that conversation. I'm just telling you I feel like it's coming, mm -hmm. um, and it's you know, that I would much rather have the thoughtful conversations um, towards uh, where you know where you're talking about. Okay, what? Let's look at where we are, muddling along as it is, and say, okay, uh, where could we get to something that we could agree upon is is a pathway forward. We're going to have Venezuela care versus muddle care. Yeah. Well, well, let me ask because someone someone asked. Um, just you know, going back to the surprise billing, if that would be a place of common ground. But I, I wonder, um, you know, if the three of you could, also, could comment on that, as well as you know, are do you think are the American voters are are they in a place now where they just want solutions and are they ready for a different kind of conversation? Um, you know, because it seems to me that they're the what they're you know what they are receptive to is is what's going to kind of oh, yes. drive things up. Here. Yes and no. I think there's part of our country that is tired of the tired and probably frightened by some of the divisiveness we have right now, but we're also in a really partisan state. So um, if, if you look at what's driving voters, we're not seeing, uh, we don't have a very healthy center in the country right now. And, and for some things, you probably need to start with center and work from there, not necessarily everything. There are some things that people are always going to feel really intensely about on, on not in the center. But right now we have a country that's really, really angry, divided. You know, there's been some violence. It's not a – I don't think people feel good about where we are, but I also don't see anybody pushing people to have sensible, calm policy discussions about the best way. Probably, I mean, there are exceptions, such as – I mean, they did manage to do opioid. You know, you can say it didn't go far enough. You can say it didn't have enough money. You can say we need more. But they did a bipartisan opioid bill that was actually a public health bill, not primarily a law enforcement bill. I mean, it did set the country on a direction that uh, I think everybody around this table would think is a useful direction to be going in. And I wonder if we're not going to be seeing more interesting activities at the state level, which has often been, I mean, I don't think there's, an ability to take what works in one state and export it to different states, but it always serves as both is like a symbolic proof of concept for different ideas. And I'm just wondering if you know we could be having this you know major debate again 
in two years, which as somebody who's done health reform for most of my adult life, I feel a little health reform fatigue, um, but putting that aside, we might have a debate, but we also might instead be focusing on like smaller, big reforms. You know, again, like the idea of you know using Medicare rates in these surprise bills, which again, like the, the Cassidy is working, the Bill Cassidy from Louisiana is working with Democrats yeah. on, they're not using the word Medicare, I want to be clear, but they're beginning to try to figure out what we could be doing in this space. So it could be these types of bills, or you start seeing a lot more state experimentation. So I'm going to do something a little radical here and defend surprise bills, um, not fully and completely, but just to make the case that providers have contracts. They have contracts with insurers who have people who are in network, and then there will be people who are out of network. And the system is structured in that relationship for you to, to have a lower rate for people in network and a higher rate for people out of network. I mean, that is sort of a fundamental structure here. Now, if we want to sit around and agree that if you're charging somebody who is out of network 3,000 times what you're charging somebody in network, I might find that offensive. I, would, I think we might even come to an agreement there. But once you say, okay, I'm going to start with the dial, and I'm going to start turning that dial, eventually you are going to get to a point where use of that dial could be problematic for the entire structure. I, I don't disagree. I think that's the policy right. needs to be careful. Right. Carefully so if you totally sure. blow up the network system, then those, those prices just rise and they get shifted to everybody and we all, you know. But, but I think the other thing about the surprise bill that people, and this is not partisan, I mean, Republicans and Democrats both get surprise bills. As, as a consumer, you're really – it's really hard to know if you're setting yourself up. I mean, either you get misinformation or you're unconscious or, um, <laughs> you know, it's a, a dire emergency. I mean, you know, I think there, there are fairly sophisticated healthcare consumers, including myself, who have, yeah. I only didn't get one because I was lucky. I asked every correct question and I couldn't get the information I needed. And in, in my case, they were small, and I, I we, were, we ended up in network, we, but only because we were lucky. I, I, I couldn't get the answers. I knew what questions to ask, and I couldn't get the Even lying there with us, I mean, they would tell me if the anesthesiologist, yeah, at that point, I still couldn't get the answer. I got the answer when the bill came. And perhaps it's some of that consumer frustration that, that my conjecture that's driving uh, mm -hmm. some of the, uh, you know, passion around issues like single payer, because perhaps it's more of a passion for simplicity in the system, um, my own personal opinion. Let me, we have just under 10 minutes left, um, and we have one more audience question that I want to ask before we wrap it up, which is um, a process question um, for all of you, which is, uh, wouldn't any uh, major reforms, um, anything regarding Medicare, et cetera, still need 60 votes in the Senate, which is unlikely for either party in 2019 or even, you know, subsequently. Um, and the, the questioner points out that the ACA only squeaked through um, when there were um, 60 Democrats in the Senate. So uh, thoughts, conjectures on that? What, like, all these ideas being what they are, um, what, what, what are the odds of actually passing anything? It depends on what it is. I mean, can you do surprise bill legislation? You could get 60 votes if you got the right balance there. I mean, that's something. There are technical issues related to what Rodney was talking about. You don't want to blow up the system, but you don't want consumers going home with a $200,000 bill, you know, because they had a heart attack and were taking the ambulance, took them down the street instead of across town where they were in there, right? You don't. We don't want that to happen. The so are there. Are you going to fix medic? Are you going to totally redo Medicare without 60 votes? No. Can you do so? It's sort of a by definition, what you can get 60 votes for is something that's bipartisan, and that'll probably be incremental. If you go the um, reconciliation route, if if in fact we have a Democratic House and a Republican Senate, which it, it, it predicts anything is crazy right now because everybody's always wrong about everything. If that's the scenario, if we have a Democratic House and the Republican Senate. It's, again, it's going to have to be bipartisan. You're not going to get things through the Senate. So if you have reconciliation in the Republican Senate, the Democratic House won't go for it. So what, if anything happens under that scenario, it's going to be more incremental, smaller. I mean, we do have a Medicare trust fund problem six years from now. There have been bipartisan. There's never been a century-long bipartisan fix, but there have been you know, 10 or 15-year fixes over time. That would have to be bipartisan. I don't see what the fix is. I don't see anyone talking about it. I don't see it happening. But in the next couple of years, they're going to have to talk about it. So incremental steps can be bipartisan, major dramatic ones, unless we're way wrong about what's happening in this election and one party ends up with this huge, overwhelming majority in both houses. 
I'm going to say something that, that I hate saying because I hate believing it. I don't like that I'm about to say this. But I'm pivoting off of what Joanne said a few moments ago about you know, the lack of a center in this country. I mean, nobody tunes in to watch the ranting of a raging moderate anywhere. That's not the way our world works. If 2021 well, I can results, think of one. Oh, uh, <laughs> Two. Uh, this room. <laughs> if 2021 results in a unified government with the same party holding the House, Senate, and White House, I fear for the future of the legislative filibuster. I don't think that a an America that, uh, that elects a sweep in 21 will hear that the minority gets to stop them in 21. I have to be glad. I'm going back to my optimism to say. I'm glass half full of battery acid. Yeah. <laughs> and it's only, it really is only because I tr I've tried very hard to learn from my experience in health policy in the past. And, you know, it wasn't that long ago, right? I think it was 2015 when uh, Republicans took over the Senate that the Republican Congress sent President Obama the macro legislation and he signed it. You know, with again, it went past the field, and it was not uncontroversial. Granted, like we got around some of the hard problems by the way they dealt with the budget offsets, which was, you know, okay. The $150 million, dollar, a billion dollar mulligan they took? Uh, less than the $1.5 trillion tax cut that got taken, so we cannot throw stones here. <laughs> uh, but it's just a signal that, like, in the midst of things, the, the policy can happen without a lot of public attention when there's good hard work, agreement on goals, there is an ability to work with each other, which I have to hope um, can be restored. And again, we have recent experiences, like again, the, again, not a big bill, but the opioid bill. NIH. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's called the NIH bill, I'm just going to read it and go through. <laughs> oh, opioid cure bill, there you go. Wow. But we see it, and I think, you know, one never knows. Well, on that note, uh, we really appreciate all of you taking your time and, and to all of our viewers taking uh, spending some time with us this afternoon. Unfortunately, that is all we have time for for today's webinar, but um, we hope that our um, audience will take time to complete the brief evaluation survey that you will receive immediately after the broadcast ends, as well as by email later today. Uh, I can't ask for a round of applause, but um, again, thank you to our panelists. Um, if you do have thoughts uh, on our broader programming at the Alliance for Health Reform, we would appreciate that as well. Uh, we have a broader audience assessment, and that's on our website at allhealthpolicy.org. So um, finally, if you are in the D.C. area, um, we hope that you can join us in person for our next event, which will be on Friday, October 19th. And uh, it will be an in-person briefing which will explore the landscape of diverse coverage policies and benefit designs that states are pursuing within their Medicaid programs and discuss the impact of these policies on beneficiaries and the healthcare delivery system. So with that, again, thank you to Joanne Kennan, Rodney Whitlaw, and Jean Lambert for joining us this afternoon. Thanks to the National Institute for Healthcare Management Foundation for supporting uh, this webinar series. And have a good afternoon. Thank <laughs> you.